Good morning, everyone. So today we are on the fourth lecture by Saz Rosenblum on error correction codes. So please. Thank you. Right. Um, today, what we're going to talk about is the future of quantum error correction, some might say. We're going to leave behind topology and uh, nice lattices, and we're going to go to non-local codes. This is going to open up a whole new range of possibilities. And by popular demand, we're, we're going to describe a uh, well-known quantum algorithm in a, in a pretty hand wavy way, but in such a way that gives also the, the correct intuition of what's going on. And we'll try to connect what's going on here with quantum error correction as well. Uh, but let's start with a recap of what we learned yesterday. We discussed quantum error correcting codes on a surface. The surface we said can be closed, it can be a torus, or it can have many uh, handles, so uh, uh, two, uh, three torus or, or a four torus, doesn't matter. It can even be um, just flat with open boundary conditions. The details will change, but, uh, but not the uh, essence. In the first day, we described a code by talking about the states. What do the states look like that are part um, of this code, right? The code is a 2K dimensional subspace of a very large Hilbert space. For example, in the surface code, the logic is zero or zero, zero, because you have two encoded qubits. The logical zero, zero is either every qubit in zero plus every qubit in zero, except rings or closed boundaries of ones. And you need to take an infinite superposition of all of these loops. They're maybe not infinite, uh, but a very large superposition. Uh, one zero is the same superposition, but you add to it a, a um, non-contractible loop that goes from one end to another. This, could, this is going to commute with all stabilizers, but it's not a stabilizer, so it's a logical bit flip. Um, right? And now you have an infinite superposition of those, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Zero one is also uh, also has a loop, but now in the different direction, um, or a string you could call it. And one one has both. There you go. These are the four states that that have these excellent properties that we want. Um, all other states are errors. This is a, it would take me more than this blackboard to write down these states, but we learned a different description, which is a stabilizer formalism that allows me to really compactify uh, the way in which I describe a code. So instead of describing this, I can just say my code is that subspace, which is stabilized by n squared stars and n squared plaquettes. And, and these states are going to be the only states that are simultaneous plus one eigenstates of all of these stabilizers. And finally, we also discussed that we can think about this as a condensed matter system, a lattice with some Hamiltonian, and the plus one eigenstate of all of these stabilizers is going to be some degenerate ground state of um, so, or um, uh, the generate manifold of ground states of this Hamiltonian. And then you can think about um, error correction as a, fa a phase transition in some sense, as we're going to see. Good. We observed that the surface code is a pretty good code. If we have n qubits, we can encode 2G logical qubits, where G is the number of handles or the number of holes you poke in your system. And the, the distance is proportional to the square root of n. It's not too bad, right? Because you need a string of errors um, across the linear dimension. And then we made some hand wavy arguments that we don't need cor to correct all errors of, um, of size square root of n. We only need to correct those errors that create this non-trivial loop. More precisely, we need to create, we need to prevent errors that span more than one half of the loop. Because if they span more than one half, you're going to complete it, or your decoder algorithm is going to complete it the wrong way, creating 
a logical bit flip. The next step is to actually or map it to, to some statistical physics model. And it turns out this model is equivalent exactly to a type of Ising lattice, which is called the random bond Ising lattice. If you've heard about that, you know what's coming. Um, but uh, many quantum computing people simulate this uh, lattice and they throw in some errors, random, and then they look what happens. And this is what happens. So on one axis, you have the probability of an error for each qubit. And on the other axis, you have the probability of a failure. So when, af when after, or what is the probability that after my decoding, I will have a paint a logical error. And this is what you're gonna get. Maybe I'm gonna choose a different color. My drawing is pretty bad, so forgive me. Okay, this kind of behavior. What am I drawing here? It might be a bit hard to see. As I, if I take a small lattice, this is what we're gonna see, this kind of line. If the error is very small, my failure probability is zero. If the error is very large, it tends to one or close to one. What happens if I increase my lattice now? Now I have this. Okay. Um, and if I increase my lattice further and further, you're gonna see that they all cross in one point or one region. This point is called the threshold of the code. The, it's an, it's a, uh, the threshold error of the code rather. What happens with the threshold is that above the threshold, we are guaranteed that if we increase the lattice, the failure probability goes to zero. But if you're, uh, excuse me, that's on this side. So if we increase the lattice, the failure probability will go to zero. If your error is worse than the threshold, increasing your lattice will make things worse. So the threshold, it's not really the threshold theorem, that's something a bit different. But this is how I would frame it. There exists a constant number, uh, the error threshold, such that the probability of failure you fail tends to zero as the, the length of the code goes to infinity, the linear size. For any P, right, so if you take a code, you have to also choose your error, your noise model. So do you have bit flips, do you have face flips? Are they dependent, are they independent? You choose your noise, then you have to choose a decoder. This set of three things will define your threshold. If you have a very bad decoder, your threshold will be really bad. And those three things together, if you choose them wisely, they can be mapped to some statistical problem. So there is a problem. There is, uh, for example, if I know where the errors are, in this case, in, in what I've told you, I don't know where the errors are. I know where the, my, where the minus one syndromes are. If you know where the errors are, it can be mapped to a percolation. If you don't know, it can be mapped to the random bond icing model. I'm not sure I, I get it. Uh, as long as the errors are local and independent, yes. uh, I thought that uh, what you are looking for is the spontaneous appearance of a so-called infinite cluster, which connects uh, uh, opposite uh, opposite edges, yes. which, which will be an error, because yeah. just 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 okay. finite clusters will not do the job. Yes, uh, and uh, I thought that uh, indeed whether the uh, the errors uh, are, are point-like or appear in the small clusters so on will uh, affect the value, numerical value of the critical P, but the, the exp exponent, the, the universality class should okay. be a percolation. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. And 
it's very, it's very often related to percolation. Usually when we say percolation, we mean something a bit different, but let's not get into those details right now. Um, okay, what is the importance? Why is it such an important thing? If you go to a, uh, an experimentalist and you say, I have a code, they will interrupt you. They'll ask, what is the threshold? Okay, it really burns. And the, the reason is that if I have a qubit, and I can make a lot of these qubits, and now the question is, can I make a quantum computer with that qubit? If my errors of my gates on my qubits and every operation, everything I do with my qubit has an error below the threshold, I can put together more and more and more qubits and the probability of failure will go to zero. And I can do any algorithm I want with a lot of qubits. If my errors are worse than the threshold, I can go home. There's nothing for me to do. I cannot do, I cannot reach zero errors by bunching together more and more qubits. This is a critical number, almost literally, uh, of, of any code. And we'll get to that. You want everything, you want all the errors to be local. The reason we chose the surface code is because we believe in a bit of a dogmatic way that we are, we are God, we can, we can do anything we want from one end of the code to the other, but the environment is, well, is a bit stupid. They cannot do that. They will always, as Yuval said, they will act locally. This is the idea of topological codes, okay? Um, and the question is, does it really work like that? If you have a system where your qubits interact all where they all interact with each other and errors can spread all over the place in a non-local way, you're in trouble when you, if you want to do error correction. Uh, any questions about this? Ah, uh, before questions, uh, you, can, you can write uh, an empirical approximation of this behavior. Remember, we kind of hand wavily said this thing that we can write something a bit more um, reliable. This is empirical, but there are analytic expressions in, in some cases. This is for the surface code, and this assumes that my measurements are not perfect. It includes noise in my measurements, noise related to P also. There's one parameter that describes every error of everything I do. You see the p to the power of d plus one over two still holds, but now there is this th p threshold in the denominator. It can be seen of a result. I made a mistake here. The probability of this kind of error happening, it's not p to the power of d plus one over two because I can have many of these. I need uh, some combinatoric sum. This will give me this p threshold. Um, and now you see clearly that if p is below p threshold, for infinite d, this goes to zero. And if p is above p threshold, this goes, well, to infinity, but it will tend to one in reality. Uh, questions? Uh, this is just a, a fit to a simulation. I don't think you can get this analytical exp expression. Oh, um, I know the answer. I don't really know it, but I can just guess. It's probably Kitaev. Oh, he did, he did. <laughs> but I, I, it's just an assumption. I'm not quite sure. Yes. Below the threshold, yes. So now, uh, so there is a threshold, right? So uh, basically, uh, this threshold actually is it putting some limit of maximum qubit? How you calculate? The threshold is constant. This is the important thing. It's the threshold is. It tells me what is the error I can tolerate for a C naught. What is the error I can tolerate for a measurement? It does not depend on the number of qubits. If it depended on the number of qubits, this wouldn't be a threshold. This wouldn't be a threshold. No, so I'm asking other way. 
Suppose if you have the threshold fixed, then uh, if you have what? Suppose in my system, uh, this threshold is fixed. Okay, to yes. some value. So does it put limit how many qubit actually incorporate in this system? No, no I don't see why it would limit, no. The limit of number of qubits is an engineering problem more than a... Okay. Problem. Okay. Yeah. So at the threshold value, this P failure is uh, 0 0.03, right? Uh, from this expression, if you get so, uh, yes. so is it like, uh, will it depend this value 0 0.03? Will it depend on uh, system to system or it is universal for? Oh, um, no, it's not universal. It depends. It depends very much on, well, it doesn't depend on the physical implementation, but it depends on, for example, how you measure the circuits, the syndrome. Remember, I drew a, a circuit of how to measure the syndrome. So it will depend on details. So, uh, okay, so this is just an I'm, example because I'm going to do some maths with this, like some examples. So I wrote down the number. So why I'm saying this because a uh, uh, P failure can go maximum up to one, right? And uh, zero point zero three threshold. This is like not, not even the halfway. It's much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's in reality, it's not here the threshold. It's really close to. Down. To the yeah down excuse me okay thank you okay one more question of someone who hasn't asked a question before think about it. um okay let's let's take an example ah and I haven't said it the p threshold for independent x and z noise for the surface code and for the minimum we weight pair matching algorithm. Remember, I need to specify code, noise, and decoder. Then I have more or less 1%, a bit less. Everyone wants to get to 99% fidelities. Why? It's not just a, a nice number, but it, it means that you can start building a quantum computer. I, ideally, you'd want to be 10 times below this. Uh, case one. study, we started this this lecture series by asking about Chor's algorithm. And we did a poll, how many qubits do you need? We can write a book about how many qubits you need for Chor's alg algorithm, but we're gonna do a hand wavy approximation that gives you the right idea. And you have to talk to a quantum uh, algorithm expert. And this expert is going to tell you that you need about for um, Chor, or 2048 uh, bit factorization. This is hard for a classical computer. And they're, they're gonna tell you, okay, you have 2000 bits in your problem. Uh, you're gonna need 10,000 logical qubits at least. This is what my circuit requires. Some Google has um, proposed a more efficient way of doing shores a few weeks ago, but I haven't read the paper yet. It's constantly changing. The depth, what does, what does it mean, the depth, right? Uh, Igor has sent me uh, a paper showing that Feynman was the first one who drew these quantum circuits. And the depth is how many layers, what, 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 how much time does this musical piece take? Yes. So these are just random gates on my qubits. And I'm asking how many, how many cycles do I need? And after every step, you have to do quantum error correction. We can equally well ask the, the algorithm expert, how many cycles of quantum error correction do I need to do for doing Shor's algorithm? And they're gonna say, my algorithm requires 10 to the power 10 cycles of QEC. And because you want the algorithm to succeed, you want the success probability, the failure probability of the entire algorithm to be 90%, so failure of 10%. And now I can calculate, I can tell the uh, algorithm expert how many qubits you need to do quantum error correction. So for every qubit, 
per, per qubit per cycle, the failure probability has to be um, 10 to the minus 10 times 10 to the minus 4 times 0.1. Okay. If I have this failure probability per step per qubit, then for k qubits with depth 10 to the 10, my error probability will be 10%, uh, so I'm good. This equals 10 to the minus 15. This is the error that a logical qubit has to have in order to survive Thor's algorithm, or in order for all qubits to survive the algorithm. This has to equal the expression we wrote there, more or less. Now I go to the experimentalist and I ask, what is your P? What is your probability of a qubit error after a single time step? And they're gonna tell me, well, maybe in one year or two years, we'll get 0 0.001. This is realistic, 99.9%, totally feasible. A few, the ion quantum computers and the superconducting quantum computers are getting very close to this. And the threshold we said is 1%. So we have here about 0 0.1. This is how much we are below the thresholds, or we hope to be in a few years. Now I can just extract D and I get D equals 27. I need a 27 on 27 qubit surface code. And so the number of qubits is approximately 1,000. If I have 1,000 qubits per logical qubit, the total number of qubits is going to be 10,000 times this, okay? so 10 million. That's where you, where you get the number. And if you do a very detailed analysis, it'll change by some counts. We want something better than this, or we're in trouble. And if we look at the root of the problem, where does it all of our, you know, where does this come from, this uh, huge overhead? And this is the reason, this guy here. I'm making bigger and bigger and bigger codes. The distance gets better, but I still have a constant number of logical qubits per surface code. What if I could, in classical uh, error correction, they have good codes, which means that when they have larger codes, the distance gets better and the number of encoded qubits gets better. If we had this, we could bring this down by an order of magnitude, or maybe more in the future. And this is what we're going to talk about next. Uh, any questions about this hand wavy calculation? So is, is Shaw's algorithm completely like local? Like uh, in the algorithm, don't we have non-local operations? Because the calculation is completely based on single qubit errors. So whatever we have done. So uh, um, I'm not an expert on how, what the circuit actually looks like. You would, you would maybe need a compiler to make your, all of your gates as local as possible. Um, oh, but the answer is, the answer because you're building it on a surface code. In a surface code, all the logical operations, which we're not gonna talk about, they are local operations. Um, um, but I really don't want to get into this, but since in the uh, since this is built on locality, you don't want to apply operations that are not local to preserve the uh, the structure of your system. So everything is going to be local. But let let's not get into this. So does that limit uh, the the implementations that could be done on the surface, like because we can implement only certain kind of operations? No, there is no limitation. The numbers I give you are realizable in actual systems. Uh, just to tell you where, where we are today, Google in 2022 were the first group in the world uh, who showed with a superconducting quantum circuit that they increased the size of the lattice and they observed a very tiny reduction in the logical error. So they are right at the threshold. 
This is where we are today. We are ages from implementing Schor's algorithm. Any questions about what I've said? Good. Let's talk about the future of quantum error correction, in my opinion, um, which is about QLDPC codes. And I promise you that I would tell you what QLDPC means in the last lecture. In my notes, this was lecture number three. We're a bit behind the schedule, but that's just fine. Um, QLDPC stands for quantum, obviously. Um, low density parity checks. We'll see why this is an important concept. But we'll start with this observation that our big problem was the number of logical qubits per physical qubit. So in this Shor's algorithm sketch that I drew, you need a thousand physical qubits and you get one logical qubit. That doesn't scale very well. So there is a thing called a concept, which is the encoding rate. Usually we just say rate of a code, which is just K over N. How many logical qubits per physical qubits do I have? For surface codes, this is zero in the limit of large n. It's some constant divided by n goes to zero. Not good. We want this to go to, uh, to one or close to one. Now you can ask the question, is it possible to take a code, maybe not the surface code, but any lattice with local interactions, which we so, so much like. Sorry, what, what did you say about the rate? It's the, in some sense, it's the rate of transmission. How many, how much information can I send per, per, bit that I sent to you, okay? So it's the efficiency of a code in some sense. It's, it's jargon. I don't know who came up with that word. That's what it's called. The question I'm asking is, can we have a topological code? What do I mean by topological code? In this sense, I just mean a code with local check operators, where the check operators are stars, uh, plaquettes, something else, but they're local that you can, Put the circle around it with local checks with high rate, constant rate, or maybe not. Uh, yeah, well, we'll save the precise statement in a second. With high rate and high distance. And the answer by Bravi, Poulain, and Terhal in uh, 09 is a resounding no. We have to give up locality. This made a lot of people very sad, especially experimentalists. Uh, the statement is not a precise statement, but for geometrically local codes, It assumes a Euclidean space, which is usually what we work with. A constant radius. We're always talking about families of codes. A code in which I can take, a family of codes in which I can take n to infinity. So I want, I ask, do I have a family of codes, like a surface code, where if I take n to infinity, I go to the thermodynamic limit, the check operators remain constant. This is a, a topological code or geometrically local code. So in the surface code, no matter how big my surface is, my stabilizers remain weight four. They all, only talk to four qubits. And every qubit only sees four stabilizers. Yeah. 
Yes, fundamental donor star. Uh, I mean, if you take both n and k to infinity, such that uh, k over n becomes uh, very large. Yes. Uh, yeah. th then it means that uh, I encode a logical bit by large number of qubits, but still it's it's a it's a volume volume which is defined by by k over n. Yes. So naively I would I would say that uh, I can make my I mean to to see if I I I, I did or did not have an error I should uh, make restrict my check to that particular volume. Is it not the case? We'll see that it's not the case. You can have, excuse me. I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay. But maybe we should, yeah, try again once okay. and then we'll see. Uh, K and N go to infinity, K over N is some fixed number, large yes. number, but fixed. Yes. And D, over, and D is over N is also some fixed number. And what? And we want D over N also to be a fixed number as N goes to infinity. This is what we want. Oh, D over N you want yes. to be fixed. We want oh. to be some constant. Or at least I, not something no, that, yeah. I thought that you want D to be constant, not D, D over okay, N. Let's, let's say what I want. We want to go with N to infinity. We want k over n to go to some constant. Ideally, we want d over n also to go to a constant. But this is not so important. It's okay if this thing goes if this thing goes down as one over square root of n. This would still be okayish in some sense. But you want this. You want d to to grow. This is important. You want d to grow with n. Why? Why do you want d to grow with n? Because you want to make better and better logical qubits. Remember, as you increase D, the failure probability of your qubit goes down. This is what we want. We want to make a perfect logical qubit by adding more and more physical qubits. And what Bravi, Poulin, and Terhal showed is that in D dimensions, K times d to the power 2 over d minus 1 is smaller than some constant times n. This is a shocker. If I take two dimensions, where we usually like to work, it doesn't really matter. Just to put a nice number here. A d squared has to be smaller than some number. I can choose. I can have a constant k, and then d grows as a square root. This is what the surface code does. The surface code saturates this bound. It has constant k and, and um, uh, distance that goes as one over the square root of n. I talked to Gerardo and we discussed this option of why, why, why don't I poke many holes in my surface code? I can have a huge surface code and I can have many handles in it so, uh, that grows linearly with the number of qubits. Okay, I can do that. I can have k that's linear, but then my distance will be constant. This will not grow. I have to make a choice. And this always has to hold. In particular, I cannot have k and d that both grow with n linearly. What does that tell us? It tells us we need to get away from local interactions. We need non-local interactions. Interactions meaning uh, long-range checks. We need long-range checks where I cannot just put a radius around the check and confine it in space. In particular, the, the range has to be proportional to the number of qubits or some polynomial of it. Means the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I knew I would get in trouble. What I mean, what I mean is that you're going to need about O n checks. This is a more detailed result. You're going to need n stabilizers that have length. Uh, 
Um, I think you need square roots. Don't quote me on this. L square root of n. This is long range. Okay. Oh, oh, it's geometrically local. I meant geometrically local. Yes, yes. Locality means something else. Um, good. So my, if I lay out my qubits on a grid, I can always do that. I can always put my qubits on a, an imaginary grid. But if I do that, then my, then my stabilizers are going to look like this. I'm going to have a, some stabilizer ancilla here, and it's going to go all over the place. I cannot put a radius around my stabilizer and say you only measure what's around you. Uh, question. Yes. So this is still in 2D. Uh, yes. Just you are giving up the fact that it's not a local check, but you are still sticking with the 2D. Um, I, I can. I don't have to. Okay. But nothing changes if you go. The, the details change when you go to higher dimensions, but uh, there is still this this bound that I, the no go that I showed you. It's just simpler to draw it in 2D. And for superconducting qubits, you have to be in 2D. You have to be on a chip. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, we remember in the first lecture, we drew this parallel between many fields and quantum error correction. I forgot to add neuroscience. I'm sure this will come very handy for people studying the, uh, you know, brain connectivity and vice versa. We gave up this non-geometric locality. This, uh, we gave up short range interactions, but there's something we do not want to give up. We want to retain low density parity. This is what you mean by locality. Low density parity checks. What does it mean? It means that every parity check talks to a constant, a small constant of qubits, or, and every qubit is only probed by a small constant of checks. So my Hamiltonian will be a very large sum of small constant size terms. I'm not going to write it down. Every qubit interacts with a constant number of checks, and every check interacts with only a constant number of qubits. Why do I really, really want this? Not because I'm somehow emotionally attached. I was emotionally attached to geometric locality as well, and I gave it up. But I cannot do quantum computing without this. If you go to an experimentalist and you say, hey, here's my stabilizer operator, my check operator, and it requires you to check the parity of n qubits where n grows to infinity is going to say you're out of your mind. Um, it not only is measuring a parity of an infinite number or of a, a macroscopic number of qubits bound to, to be uh, full of errors, it's going to be a very large circuit to measure this, it also causes you to spread the errors across the circuit. You still want to check Every time you measure something, you want it to, it to touch only a few qubits. Um, moreover, it, you can show that with this kind of codes, doing quantum computations, which we haven't talked about, is much more efficient. This is something we really want to maintain. Remember, we wrote down these parity check matrices, HX and HZ, or total H for the four qubit code, it was this. What does it mean to be LDPC mathematically? It means that H is sparse. Sparse meaning if I put just zeros and ones, then I only have a few ones here and there. Because every qubit only sees a few checks and every check only sees a few qubits. It translates to every row as uh, a constant number of ones and every column also has a constant number of ones. It does not, this constant doesn't grow as I increase the size of the population. One being wherever it's not identity. Can I ask a question? I'm, I'm, yes, I feel can. that I'm uh, 
losing you. Uh, I mean, the, the, the picture I have in mind, and maybe this is uh, too naive and uh, completely wrong, is that uh, you take the entire space of your uh, K qubits, mm -hmm. divide them into small volumes, N, N volumes, and... No. Uh, this is not, you have to give up this intuition. The K qubits, I'm gonna have this kind of code. It's gonna have a large number of logical qubits and a large, a large distance, but you cannot think of these qubits, logical qubits in some partition of space. They're going to be spread out over the, over, everything is spread out, okay? Is overlap between them or not? Mm. Mm. So I have qubit number 270, 350, 415, mm. which belong to one logical qubit and then a few others that belong to another that's, and so on. That's a good question. I, I'm not sure if there is any overlap, but there could be, but there's not gonna be a large overlap. But, but if there is no large overlap, then it's a redefinition of my metric. I mean, I, I can still uh, say that there is a certain volume, maybe spread geographically, which belongs to a logical qubit number one, yes, and then for another set which belongs to the qubit. You can always arrange the qubits any way you want, but then the connections are the connections are going to be garbled. Yes, you're right. You can always position. Oh, okay, so so suppose I do that. Suppose I don't have overlap, mm -hmm. and I order the the, the, the qubits. We're going to see an example of this code inside. No, but but yeah. my, my 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 naive question, mm -hmm. I mean, very extremely low level. Is this after I did it? After I, I, I arranged it in in fractal volumes, each one uh, mm -hmm. responsible for one logical qubit. Uh, I I know from from you that uh, uh, the space I'm working is this pizza slice, which uh, where where the the parity are all plus one. But but this this this, this uh, uh, the, the eigenvalue of the stabilizers are plus one. So if I have an error, no, actually uh, I I regret what I said. You cannot do this. I'll tell you why. The number of of these partitions scales as um, as n. Yes. Oh no, this is right, so it's okay. Uh, so, even in the toric code, the encoding is completely non local because the entire system encodes the two qubits. So, you cannot say this part of the toric code encodes qubit number one and this part encodes qubit number two. So they are overlap. all so there, must, I full think there must be overlap, yeah. Full overlap, complete yeah. overlap. There is a difference between the physical qubits you have, okay? That is, you know, the different vertices or the bones or whatever you have in the, in the code. And where you are encoding your logical thing, you are encoding in a non-local way, so, but you address locally. What I thought you meant, no you, way, once, overlap. Yes, one yes, second. Yes, no. The discussion is not with you. Yes, after thank you. Um, the logical operators are non-overlapping, I think, but the logical information is spread all over. Okay, let's go on because this is not, it's important, but it's not important to understand what's going on. It's easy to show for some people that um, good quantum codes exist. Not a problem, this was done in the early days. Good meaning, linear rate, linear distance in both rate and distance. But these were not LDBC codes. They were, the checks were not sparse. You could never implement this. Exists. So meaning K is proportional to N and D is proportional to N. But there was a long standing question whether good quantum LDPC codes exist. And only last year or two, we uh, learned that also, this is 21 and 22, Antelev Kalachev, uh, Iridino, Thomas Vidik, and others, um, that showed that 
good QLDPC codes exist. This was a major breakthrough. They're based on something, or very often based on something we call uh, expander codes. We're going to talk a little bit about this if we have time. And, you know, it's kind of amazing. Uh, six months ago, someone came to me and asked, Do you, have you heard about expander codes? And I said, no, I'm not sure. And now there are, you know, a few papers every day about this stuff on the archive. It has really exploded. It's a really interesting field to get into now. So also K equals N and the or proportional to N. What I hope to show you today briefly is not this, this would take me too much time, um, but we'll be satisfied with a code that is still much better than the surface code. And it's a code that has K proportional to N and D proportional the square n, square root of n. So this ends is like the surface code, but now I have a number of logical qubits that scales with the volume of the surface code. So I gain a lot. And a lot of the benefits of QLDPC codes already hold for this. Um, it would be nice to move to this. It has a lot of benefits, but most benefits already come here. Uh, QLDPC refers to the sparsity of the matrix. When we say good QLDPC, good means linear in N and this, I don't know how it's called, what it's called. I, I call it pretty good QLDPC, but this is just me. As long as you're clear. This is the best you could, oh, you couldn't do better than this. There is just, you know, this is Shannon entropy. You cannot encode more qubits than you, yeah. So there's actually a limit of how large this proportion, this proportion can be. It has to do with the uh, Shannon entropy of the noise, something. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the optimal. Good. Let's briefly, and not so briefly, discuss this construction because it's very, it's very surprisingly simple and intuitive. It's called, it doesn't, it's not called in a, way that makes it look simple and intuitive. Well, the hypergraph or tensor product code. And it comes, it was invented by uh, Zemu and, um, oh, and Tillich. Um, and it came from a simple realization. You have a toric code. Oh, what am I doing? It's not a torus. But what's happening is people are, people know that classical, good LDPC classical codes exist. They've known this for decades. This is why it's so important to learn from classical information theory people and try to bring their constructions to the quantum realm. So there's always a question, how can I take two classical codes or more classical codes and make them into a quantum code? We've seen one such, such construction. It's the CSS construction. This is a code, a classical code. There's only bit flips in the classical world. This is also a classical code. Base flip is just a bit flip with your head rotated. And then you just put them together in one matrix. And it works. When does it work? What do you need to satisfy, remember? Yeah, the H, um, HX times HT, HZ transpose is zero. It just means that they have to commute or overlap in a, an even number of locations. Otherwise, this doesn't stabilize any state. And we're going to see this is not a good way to construct your quantum codes in such a way that will make them pretty good. But the torus, if you uh, ask a mathematician, they will tell you that the torus equals a multiplication of two circles. If you take a circle and you drag the circle or you multiply the circle by another circle, you get the torus.
So maybe we can write the product, the surface code as a product of two classical codes. And it turns out, yes, you can. What would be a code that is a, rep represented by a circle? So this is a, cube, a bit, a bit, a bit. These are bits. And the checks is checks that check the parity between each two bits. This is a circular code. Anyone care to guess what code this is? What are the code words of this code, this classical code? It's all zeros or all ones. Everything has to have this equal parity. So it's a repetition code, right? Zero, 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 one, 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 one. So in, in a sense, and we're going to see in what sense, the torus code is just a product of two repetition codes. Very loosely, it's a, an X repetition code times a Z repetition code. So in this sense, a repetition code, which has N bits, one encoded uh, logical bit, and it has distance N, because to go from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, you need to do N bit flips, times um, N, 1, N, equals a torque code. Now it's a quantum code and it has two n squared to n. This is the torque code. And I want to show you how we can think about the torque code as a multiplication of codes. You'll notice that I drew something a bit different. I made a string of bits and drew dots that are the checks. I didn't make that up. It's called the tenor graphs of the code, tenor graph. It's very useful. And it, it used to be a bit obscure, but now a lot of people are using it in the quantum error correction literature. So it's very useful to know. It's just another representation of the code. We've seen many. We've seen the H matrix. Uh, we've described codes by, by, the, by, the, by the states in the code, but you can also just Oh, let's start with classical. You have bits. Yes. Yeah, so the product does not necessarily give, bring you to a topological um, a game that turns topological codes to non-topological codes. Hmm? Tanner. When you take product between two spaces, I mean, you know, you, you can have a twist. Yes. You may not have a twist. Can yes. one use that yes. mathematics here? And is yes, there anything yes. interesting? There is a thing called twisted uh, or Maybe is this equivalent to fiber bundle codes? Yes, the answer is yes. There's a, a very rich variety. The hypergraph is just one of them. Um, and I, I would never claim to even know a linear proportion of the codes that exist or the constructions that exist. It's really exploded. So Serge, and, yes? just a comment to relate what you're talking about. I didn't know about this result to dualities. So this is exactly the same thing as the duality of the Tory code, Kita F Tory code, to two icing chains, classical icing chains. Yes. So it's just realized. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, right. So I have bits, and these are my checks, and this is a repetition code. What does it mean? It means that if I have a check and it has these two edges, well, the check asks. Are these two bits the same, or is there some zero? And this one asks, are these two zero, etc. And this gives you zero, 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 or one, 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 one. For example, if I have an error and my string is zero, 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 one, 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 then my syndrome is going to be zero, zero, but this one is going to sum up to one. It's not going to be happy. 
So I'm going to have a non-zero syndrome. Okay? This is just another way to graphically represent a code. This is a classical repetition code. And for a quantum code, what I do is, well, I just add more checks, but now they're, they're not uh, Z checks. So classical code, in a sense, they're Z checks, right? They check if the number of ones and zeros is even or odd. Now I have X checks. Oh, this would be a not, a, not a smart way to do it. Let's, let's draw a correct quantum code. So let's take my favorite number, four qubits. And let's do something like this. So this is my uh, Z code. And my X code would be one stabilizer, one check operator. Oh, did I do something wrong? What does it mean? It's, this means that my H, my parity check matrix is X, 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 Z, Z, I, I, and I, I, Z, Z. This is the graphical, the Tanner code representation of the four qubit code we've seen almost ad nauseum. Okay, is it clear? Now let's take, a, this is not a product of two codes. This is just stitching two codes together. The big problem here, as I've said, is you cannot just take any two classical codes and stitch them together because they have to commute. Sometimes it's even impossible. What we really want is a way to stitch codes together in a way that makes it always possible and doesn't constrain it by asking that they overlap on an even number of spaces per se. Um, so we want a smarter construction that has a bit more, a bit less structure than this. Hello, can we yes. only use this for CSS codes? Hmm? Can we only use this representation for CSS codes? Yes, we can always write a CSS code like this, but I cannot take two classical codes that I like and just put them together. That I cannot do. They have to, they are very constrained. And I don't want too many constraints because I want a, weird looking code, I need to reduce my constraints. And, and the product is something that enables me to do that. So here's how it works. And I'm just going to do it graphically because I think it captures, you get the intuition. Let's take two repetition codes. Each one has three qubits and two checks. I'm gonna put the checks at the end for convenience. You see already where the product is going to come. I have a, a line here and a line here, and I'm going to fill the middle. Good. And now I'm going to put qubits for my quantum code. So here is a classical code, here is a classical code, and I'm going to put the qubit as a, you know, a Cartesian product um, of these two sets of classical bits. Good. And what are my checks going to be? Well, you can imagine that my checks are, uh, need one more color. I'm, I'm gonna change colors a bit. So my Z checks are going to be here. And my X checks are going to be here. And how do I draw? This is just laying out the, the qubits and the checks. Now I need to connect them, right? So the classical code was like this. So the first check looks at this and this, and the second check looks at this one and this one. They're, they all look at the pair. And, uh, This one looks at this pair. You might want to draw it for yourself when you're at home, relaxed. Maybe now, and 
the notes will be on the website. You don't have to draw this. The way I define my quantum parity checks is as such. I just copy the code over and over again. Okay, so I have now many copies of my code and I copy it again, et cetera, et cetera. Good. And I do the same in the other dimension. These are the Z checks and the Z checks talk to these. No. Like so. Okay, and again, I repeat. I think you get the idea. I'm not gonna draw them all. But there is a problem. Again, they need to commute. I cannot get rid of this. Okay, but I can make them, I can force them to, to commute. Let's see how. It's maybe a bit hard to see. Um, but you'll notice that, for example, this qubit, or this parity check, and this parity check here, they only meet at this qubit. That's not, uh, um, that's not good enough. They have to meet at two places in order for them to commute, or an even number. But I can fix it. The way I'm going to fix it, I'm going to add more qubits. Okay. I'm going to complete this square. And again, I'm going to copy the code to these qubits. It's again a just, I'm taking this and I'm copying it here. But notice that this time a bit becomes a check and a check becomes a bit. Okay. Okay, you get the idea. You, can, you should look at it more carefully uh, tonight with the notes. But now, oh, I might. Oh, uh, yes, 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 thank you. Okay, still, these are red. Yes, thank you very much. This is important. Well, it was still a mistake. But <laughs> oh, it's fine. I don't claim this to be correct. It would be crazy if it was, but in the notes, it should be correct. But that's not the important thing. Um, okay, the point is, a big mess. The point is, if before the checks met on only one qubit, now there are these helper qubits, and they will always meet also at the helper qubit. Okay, they're equally good qubits. I just call them helper qubits because they are used to force the codes to commute. What you're going to have? Let me draw it. I'll take out only the checks that we care about. So I want to know if this check this X check and this Z check, before, in the beginning, they met only once. And now I put a qubit here, and I have this line now. They will always meet at an even number of qubits now. I'm good. What do I want you to remember if you don't understand this very simple graph? I want you to remember that I can take any two classical codes, turn them into a quantum code, and they will automatically commute. This is a big step forward from this one, this construction, where I couldn't do this kind of trick. This is the insight. And I want you to check, it's also a lot of fun, that this is the surface code, okay? What you have to do is to take these extra qubits, put them in the middle, and Look at it for 10 minutes, and you'll see that it's exactly a surface code. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, how, how do you decide how many helper uh, qubits you need? Uh, how do I decide how many qubits you need? You know, helper qubits. So you originally uh, in, wanted to encode, let's say, nine qubits there. It's always this number. It always fills the square. Okay, Because with this square, I can always do this. I need an, a qubit that, that is common to both checks, okay? 
So let's see, how many qubits do I need? And the, and the codes don't even have to be the same. I can take two different codes. It will also work. I'll have a rectangle, not a square. We can live with that. So the number of qubits of my new quantum code n, how many qubits does it have? It has n squared. n is the number of bits in the classical code. So the number of qubits is n squared plus, plus what? The number of checks squared, exactly. In this case, it's n minus one, but it's, it's r squared. r is the number of checks. Good. Um, I can rewrite this. Remember, uh, r is n minus k pizza slicing. Good. This is the number of qubits in my new code. Roughly, I have n squared qubits in my new code if I start with an n bit classical code. It's, just, it's a product code, so it's no surprise. How many stabilizer generators do I have? How many checks do I have in my quantum code? In total. Someone from the back. My classical code is N, uh, has n bits and r checks. Someone said something? Two and r, thank you. Why? These are my checks and these are my checks. Two and r. This equals two times n minus uh, times this. Now I can calculate how many logical qubits are encoded. It's just k prime equals n prime minus r prime. You do the maths, you get that it's k squared. This I like. Okay, if you have k bits encoded in your classical code, you're going to have k squared qubits encoded in your quantum code. This doesn't look very constant to me. Um, of course, in the repetition code, my k was constant, so my k prime is going to be constant too. But if in my classical code, k is proportional to um, n, then k prime is going to be proportional to n squared. And n squared is, is, is this, okay? No, it's. So if I have a code where k is some alpha times n, then k prime is alpha squared times n squared. And n squared is equal to n prime up to some constant. So it's alpha squared n prime. Now look, I have k proportional to n or k prime proportional to n prime. Yes, k prime is proportional to n prime. is what I wanted. This is true uh, if my checks are independent. If they're dependent, this changes a little bit, but it's still, it's still okay. Uh, just by looking at this, you can see that if, my, if this code is LDPC and this code is LDPC, my quantum code will be LDPC too. How do I know that? Well, if the number of connections here is constant and the number of connections of this check is also constant, then this is gonna have a different constant number of connections, it's not gonna blow up. So far, so good. We have one open question left. What about the distance? Yes. What is the distance of this code? And I'm going to disappoint a little bit, I'm not gonna, prove anything here, it's not as simple, but you can just observe and understand what's going on. This is my product code schematically. And it came from some uh, two classical codes, right? I had a, C, a code CX, it was represented by some pentagraph, whatever. 
and I had some other code CZ, which was represented by another telegraph. And what is the what is the structure of this code? The structure, as we said, it's a repetition of the same classical code in every column. And it's a duplication or multiplication of this code in every row. This is what my code looks like. And you can imagine that uh, if I have a, um, an, a logical bit flip on this code and I apply it on a column, it will do a logical bit flip of my project. In the, in the case of the Tory code, what is the distance of a repetition? The distance of a repetition is I need to flip all the bits. So in the Tory code, if I flip all the, the bits here, all the qubits, I have a logical error as well. Okay. So here's the, the problem. The problem is that D prime, the distance of my new code, it's just the minimum of the distances of these two codes. If they're equal, the distance is just going to be the same. This is why this is not a good LDPC code, but a pretty good LDPC code. Why? N squared, N prime is N squared. K prime is K squared. If I wanted a good code, I need a D prime to be D squared, but it's not, it's D. And so my code is going to be, if I, have, if I, if I start with a good classical code, I'm gonna get n something proportional to n and something proportional to square root of n. So I will never get away with the square root in the case of the hypergraph product. Good. Hmm. Interesting. I can do two things now, and I have to collapse myself. One thing I can do is to show to you that a good classical code exists and what it looks like. The other thing I can do is to show you an algorithm, a quantum algorithm. By popular demand, I'm going to do the quantum algorithm one, but I want to, <laughs> to spend one minute just telling you what this classical code is. What does it look like? It's the one that I've told you existed for decades, and it's called an expander code. I think it's used in 5G. And expander codes are very simple in the sense that if you take a random code, it's going to be an, it's going to be an expander code. So they're ubiquitous. Expander just means here's my classical code. Here are my qubits. I want the number of checks to be some proportion of the number of, of bits. Okay, if I do that, then the number of logical qubits is going to be proportional to the number of bits. An expander code means I have a, a low density graph. So the degree is constant. Every, every, um, let's do it like this. Every bit only sees a few checks. And every checks only sees a few bits. Okay, so three, for example. So it's this kind of code. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Expander means that it's if you pick it randomly, it will spread out. It will look like every check is connected almost to every uh, bit, but it's not. It just looks like it. It has many properties of an all-to-all -all connection, but it's it's constant. It always has three. Okay. If I wanted to be an all-to-all, -all, every everyone would need to have n. This code. This expander code has linear distance and linear um, number of qubits of bits. And I suggest you read a very brief explanation of why this is the case. So how do I do a uh, pretty good QLDPC code? I put one expander code here, classical expander code. I put one classical expander code here and that's it. That's all we have to do. And people actually run random codes and they see which one works best. 
This is what we gained by getting away from the CSS construction. You can just choose any two codes and it'll be fine. Good. Let's go to Grover's algorithm. But of course, I'm going to connect it to quantum error correction as well. Grover's algorithm is a search algorithm. You want to find, and you have some set of possible solutions and you want to find the right one. It's also called the uh, unstructured search problem. And I'm basing myself on the lecture notes of Peter Shore, who explains it very nicely. Uh, an example is I have some, um, I have a pick a number, 34, and I'm looking for um, three numbers that's whose cube uh, equals 34. This was a number that satisfies this was discovered. Um, in, when? A few years ago, and I think the number is 42. This is a very hard problem. Um, and the solution was a 17 digit number. It's because these numbers can be negative as well, right? So how do you do this? You just go over the, the brute force approach is you pick an X, you pick a Y, and then you see if um, this minus, well, if this is a cube. Okay? If this is just third root of this is, a, is an integer. Good. We're not going to talk about this algorithm. What I want to say is that how many steps does this code take? It takes 34, uh, 10 to the 34 steps. Yes. You can, there is more efficient algorithms, of course, but the, uh, yes, 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 integers, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'm just going to say that there are 34 potential solutions, not numbers, solutions. Why? Um, well, before you, got, you, before you get to the right answer, okay, because you pick an X, and then you have to pick a Y, and then you have to look if it works. So it's this squared. This is a, a large number of steps. No, I mean, you could, you could run it forever. For this code, it would run for 10 to the 34 steps if you do it brute force. What I'm trying to say is that with Grover's algorithm, this, this is gonna be hopeless. I'm not gonna. Um, with Grover's algorithm, you can do it in the square root of this number of solutions, okay? Suppose you have a thousand options or a million options. In a classical algorithm, you go to option one, you look inside, doesn't work. You go to option two, doesn't work. In a quantum code, magically, with Grover's algorithm, you only have to look a thousand times. This is the magic of Grover's algorithm. Well, it's not so much magic as you'll see, but it's, it's pretty astounding. Um, we start with a thing, how does it work? We start with a thing called an oracle. This is the thing where I look inside okay, and it tells me, did I find it or not? Uh, the oracle can be calculate if your proposed solution works. Sometimes you can have a circuit that calculates if a solution works, but for us, it's now a black box. We assume that there is some OP, why OP, I don't know. Or O for Oracle. Hmm? The Oracle. O is an operator. On an, it's, I call it the Oracle. I call it the Oracle because for me, it's a black box. It's a black box. I give it a number and it spits out whether it's correct or not. In the quantum world, it's gonna apply a face flip if it's correct. And it's going to not apply a phase flip if, if X, X is, um, is not the solution. 
again, the implementation of O will depend on the type of problem. And in the classical world, you would have to make, uh, you know, N queries to O. And in the quantum world, we'll, we're going to show we only make square root of N queries to O. This is, this is how I'm going to quantify how many numbers, you know, how complicated, how efficient your solution is. The questions about the setup, I might have garbled it a little bit. I'm going to show you a circuit that has to apply O square root of N times, and it will find the right solution, where N is the number of possible solutions. Any questions? This cannot have been clear. Now I don't believe you. <laughs> what is the name of that problem? Is this a Fermat's problem maybe? Could be, it's related. Um, no, Fermat is if it's uh, equal to some uh, number cubed, right? Okay, whatever. I don't know what it's called. You know? Do you know? No, no, no. Uh, uh -huh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's move on. How do we do this? And the nice thing is that it starts like every other quantum algorithm. In the quantum algorithm, you want to put the yourself in a superposition of all possible options. This is called parallelism, okay? In a quantum, in a classical computer, you read this in the popular press. You try one input and then another and then another. We're going to put ourselves in a superposition of all inputs. So um, psi, this is our initial state, the square root of n sigma uh, i. And I goes from one to n minus one. How do I put myself in a superposition of all possible states? Which gauge do I have to use? Hedemard. Hedemard, remember? Hedemard is a gate that takes zero and it puts me in zero plus one. If I have zero plus one times zero plus one times zero plus one times zero plus one, I have a sum over all possible bit streets. So I start with all zeros, and I apply a Hadamard to every um, to every qubit, and this is how I start in, in psi. Good. And now I'm going to do an iteration. I'm going to do a sequence of steps, and I'm going to do it over and over again. And after square root of n times, I will get the right solution. What, what is this iteration? The iteration starts with applying the oracle. The oracle will flip the specific state which is in the right solution. Of course, I cannot just measure it now because I still have a superposition of all cold words. It's just that the phase of this one is flipped. I need to do more things. I need to take out the solution, this term that has a minus sign. At this point, what I have is I started with a superposition of all possible solutions. And after applying the Oracle, what I have is still a superposition of all possible solutions, but one of them is going to be flipped, right? My search, my space, my, what do computer scientists call it? I don't know. Um, yeah. For example, I have a million pages and I want to see if there's one that says uh, Yuval Gerd. Okay, so a, uh, I need a superposition of a million possible states. I need log bits or log qubits to encode this number, but um, good. Number two. I apply Hadamard again on every qubit. Number three, I'm going to apply a gate 
unitary transformation to zero zero minus I'm going to skillfully ignore it. And four, I'm going to apply head mark again. And zero zero is well, it's a projector onto uh, this one. But what's going on? I'm, I'm going to explain. First of all, this is a unitary operator. How do you see this? Well, this applies a phase of plus one to zero, zero, but it's going to apply a phase of minus one to every other one. It's a unitary matrix. I can write it as one minus one minus one minus one. You can write this with, a, if you have uh, X's and Z's and C naughts, you can write such a circuit. I'm not going to bother. I wouldn't know how it was. Okay, what is this combination of three things do? Let's look at HN uh, 200 zero zero minus identity H. What is what is Hadamard on zero? Yes, but Hadamard to the power n on zeros. Oh, excuse me. This is zero n. Yeah, this is zero to the power n and zero to the power n, of course. Yes, it's again. It's it's my initial state, right? It's psi. I do Hadamard on zero. It's just the superposition of all possible states. So this equals two times psi psi, my initial state, minus the identity. Because Hadamard squared is just identity. And if I well, just take Hadamard, square it, and you'll see that it gives the identity. Good. So we translated these three actions together into this. What does this do? This one, if you have any state and you apply psi psi to it, it calculates the average. How do I see this? Psi, it's one over, well, it's one over square root of n. Okay. If I take any state, I calculate its overlap with uh, you know, state number i, and I sum them up. And then I divide it by, by square root n. I will have another square root n from the other side. It calculates the average amplitude of all my states, of all of these. Um, and then it applies this average to every state in the superposition. So if I, so suppose I have some state phi and I apply this operator. Well, then it will give me um, two times the average amplitude. Two times, uh, let's, let's call it, uh, um, I don't know, S. And then minus identity. So minus the uh, amplitude of phi. Call it five. Good. What does this do? If I take twice the average and I subtract, uh, this is the average, and I subtract this number, I'm gonna, this is a reflection around the average. Okay, you see this? So this is, uh, this equals s plus s minus phi. So my new amplitude is the average plus the difference between the average and my amplitude. So I get here. Long story short, what this triplet of operators does remember, I had an equal superposition. I applied two, three, four. Oh, I applied the oracle, it gave me this. And now I reflect around the average. But what is the average? The average, if I have a very large number of states, the average is going to be more or less this, right? So if I reflect around this, each one is going to stay about the same, except this one. 
This one is going to flip to here. It's going to have twice the amplitude. And now I just repeat it over and over again. I go back to, uh, to one. I apply the oracle. I got this. And then I reflect it. Okay, I grow even higher, etc. So I have, this is a way, it's called amplitude amplification. It's a way of taking this phase and turning it into the size of this, uh, of the amplitude of the state. Good. What is the height of this thing? As long, this is true, as long as the average, I'm almost up. As long as the average is about, un, is, is kind of unchanged. But if you do it more rigorous, rigorously, it will hold. So the height of this thing is 2K plus one divided by uh, square root of N. Okay. But why? So we started with one, the height, initial height was one over square root of N. After one step, it went to three over square root of N. After two steps, it went to five. Okay, this is why. How many steps do I need in order for this to grow close to one? Square root of N. There you go. Okay, so I've shown that if I apply the oracle and some other stuff, square root of N times, I amplify the right solution. And if I measure, if at the end of square root of n times, I measure the state of my system with a very high probability, I will just measure the correct solution. This is Grover's algorithm. I'll say yes to the question. Ah, uh, for computer scientists, this is called a black box. So a very large number of, you know, people very often study algorithms where they have a black box. It's, a, it's an interesting problem by itself. If you want to actually build it, you need to understand your problem and you need to encode, you need to write a circuit that tells you if the solution is, if you give it a solution, it checks if it's correct or not. Sometimes it's easy to, sometimes it's easy to do. If you can check a solution easily, you can write a circuit. Yes, I'm, I'm done, but I wanna, is there time for questions? Okay. I think he's still trying yeah. to. But let us just first thank Sarge for the. Uh, okay. Continue the question. Yes. The problem was that we didn't know the solution, right? In the first place. The problem was that we know how to check the solution. Okay, We can check if the solution is correct. But there are so many possible solutions, and I don't have the time to check them all. So here I have a circuit that can check if my solution is correct, but I don't have to iterate n number of times. I only have to iterate square root of it. Remember, in my original problem, if I ask you, oh, is this x and this y and this z, does it satisfy this? You can write a circuit that checks it. But now you have to try it over and over and over again for a large number of possibilities, right? This is the problem. I, I did not convince you. I still don't know, like, how do you uh, apply this, hat, this uh, OP? Depends on the problem, okay? For some problems, you can write in, uh, a circuit that will do this. Okay, but let, maybe this will take offline. And I, I will take more questions. I want to just do a poll. Because I promised I would correct, connect this to quantum error correction. This is not part of the lecture, it's Paul. <laughs> so we have Shor's algorithm and we have Grover's algorithm. Which one do you think we'll be using uh, first in real life? It might take a while for both, but which one will be first? Who says everyone has to vote? Which one will be first? Shor's? Who says Shor's algorithm? Who says Grover? Oh, wow. Oh, you're all correct. Good. I was not expecting this. Maybe I'm underestimating my audience. Um, the reason is, yes, Grover's will be one of the last problems we will solve with, with quantum computing. The reason is because our speed up is only quadratic. 
And it's been proven that you cannot have more than quadratic speed up. So and a quantum computer cannot exponentially speed up everything. It can exponentially speed up a few problems. And most problems, it can only give a quadratic speed up. But remember, we have this error correction machine. We lose, you can, you can very easily lose your advantage if your speed up is only quadratic. If you have an exponential speed up, then you become, the quantum computer becomes advantageous very quickly. This is not the case here. So you might have to wait a while before your, your grandkids might see, might see this in action. Good. Questions? Questions. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so um, um, yeah, again with the Oracle only. So when, when we are do, writing a, like a classical code to execute this, what we do is we substitute some numbers for X, Y, and Z, and we check whether it is equal to 42. And if it's equal to 42, it brings up a flag. For example. Yeah. And so that's what we are going to do here, but using the circuits. So any now, classical circuit can be written as a quantum yeah, circuit. Yeah, that could be done. So now um, that if check that if these numbers equal to 42 in the quantum case, won't that be a measurement? So that is what always bugs me when I think. No. Of oh, that's a good question. So checking sounds like a measurement, right? You have to look in the box and see if it's the right solution. What you can do in the quantum case is you can have a circuit that tells you if it's a correct solution. You don't look at it. You take an extra qubit and you flip its phase controls on whether this is a solution or not. So if it's a solution, it gives you one on, on one of the qubits. And then you flip this qubit if it worked. And then what you can do is you can undo your entire computation. You remove every information. What you're left with is only um, this minus one side. So this is how you would implement this system. Thanks. Never look. Yeah, so uh, there after applying this three Hadamard, then uh, two zero zero minus i and again Hadamard. So the solution, so you are seeing that uh, so one by square root and that goes to three by square root n, right? Uh, the probability. Yes. Yeah, so so one by square root n that comes from the overall normalization, I guess, right? Yes. So uh, like after every cycle uh, is the normalization again, like you have. Yes, that's what I said. This is an approximate way of looking at it. It works as long as the average stays more or less one of a square root of n. This is true in the beginning. Mm -hmm. At the end, the average is going to, uh, well, it might even never change. If your number of solutions is large enough, this is a good approximation. But it's a hand wave, I agree, it's a hand wavy argument. It can be done precisely, but then our kind host would be very mad. Yeah. And chair. More questions? Hello. So recently, you go first. Okay. So recently, there was a controversial paper that claimed that Grover search doesn't give quantum advantage, and their argument was that uh, for a classical pro uh, for a problem which is hard to solve in a classical computer, the oracle for the quantum counterpart is so complicated and it will take enough time. What? for a problem which cannot be solved in a like will take long time in a classical computer. So if you want to do it in a quantum computer, the corresponding oracle will be so complicated and the time it will take is too long that it will technically not give any advantage. So, I mean, do you have any comment on it? Uh, I have not read the paper, I've heard about it. I know it was dismissed by, um, by the vast majority of experts. Um, and this is all I can say about it. So as far as I know, it's not controversial to claim that Grover does give you a speed up. I can comment on this because the author of, one of the authors of the paper sits just two offices next to me in Grenoble. But then you're biased. Uh, a bit, but 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 then I, I I've also looked uh, into it a little bit. Basically, the reason the majority of experts dismisses the paper is that the majority of experts think of quantum algorithms 
as asymptotic, uh, like when you say algorithm scales is O of N or O of square root of N, you think of infinitely large N, uh, whereas the paper deals with reasonably sized uh, problems. That's one serious thing. So that paper does not claim absence of quantum advantage in the mathematical sense. It claims absence of quantum advantage in practical sense within reasonable And we know problems. anyways that for small... Now, now, yes. now the second thing, Let's... and that's some, some why I believe that paper is valuable, yes. is that, uh, for example, in Grover, you have this oracle. Mm -hmm. And this oracle, it can be a classical circuit. It's just a classical computation, but it has to be implemented on a quantum computer. Yes. When we think of a classical circuit, we think of virtually no errors. Your computer does not make any errors, uh, or if it does, there is enough machinery that you don't think about it. But if you implement a classical circuit on a quantum computer, it's going to make errors which yes. means so that you you yes. may find um okay. you may find a solution you're you correcting the grover search procedure but to a wrong problem because your oracle makes mistakes I, and basically one, one the, the, let's, the, let's, let's, uh, let, let me let me make so the that... statement what the paper says uh, the, uh, then so basically the paper the paper says let me estimate uh the errors of the uh classical circuit, they use, I think, three SAT problems, some specific benchmarking problem. Uh, let me Kilo, estimate Kilo. I, I the really errors suggest... on the quantum computer and I they think show- people are getting that, restless. That... I want to say that it's, it's known that quantum error correction will make this much harder. That's why we said in the beginning, it's, it will be long scale, but even in the presence of quantum error correction, the square root of N still holds. The constants you have to, to bridge a large gap before you can see the speed up, but let's not continue this discussion. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, yeah. So you said this uh, goes like under root n, uh, like you get the, in under root n steps, you reach the answer because you are amplifying it in that much amount of steps, right? Uh, but you are amplifying it only when uh, you are looking out of the potential set of solutions, only one, uh, you want to amplify only one value, but what if you are looking for a, like you ask a different question where you are uh, like potential solutions out of the potential solution sets can be of the order of n. I'm not sure I understood. Uh, maybe we can... ah, 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 oh my, this is. Yeah, I think. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I think this can be generalized to maybe to handle a like constant number of solutions, but yeah, I, I would have to come back to you. I'm not sure. Okay. More questions? Maybe a question about something that wasn't clear to someone. Oh, and okay. yes. Can I make a, a final remark? Yeah. I promised Gantati I would give some final remark. So it's, it's your fault. Uh, I want to say a few words about where this field is going and what are the exciting uh, prospects. Um, for experimentalists like me, making better and better qubits, we want to get this P there low. And I, I have to shamefully uh, promote my lab. We, we are making very special superconducting qubits, which are called bosonic qubits. And they reach coherence times close to 100 milliseconds soon. This is two orders of magnitude better than, than standard superconducting qubits. And people are pushing this further and further. Uh, from a theoretical perspective, though, uh, I think, well, for computer scientists, they have to invent new algorithms that give you exponential speed up because there aren't enough. This is not an audience for of computer scientists. So for condensed matter scientists, I would say that one of the most important things is to use your skills and your knowledge in condensed matter physics and in statistical physics and try to better understand phase transitions and you know, all kinds of properties of these non-geometrically local codes 
where you have long range connectivity. People are studying it, but I think it didn't, it doesn't get quite the amount of um, emphasis it deserves. And this field is booming. So if you're, if you have some skills that could make, give you, uh, that could help you make progress in this, I think you'll be uh, royally rewarded in many senses after this evening. <laughs> yes, uh, this was my final statement. Okay, so if no question, let's thank Saj again. That was excellent series of questions.